You're in the water loop. <laughs> Waterloop is a nonprofit media outlet featuring conversations about water solutions and science. Visit waterloop.org. This is episode number 156, A New Approach to Agriculture. Algae blooms that pollute waterways, produce toxins, and cause dead zones are one of the most widespread and challenging environmental problems in the U.S. Nitrogen and phosphorus from agricultural land is the leading fuel for the algae blooms, but efforts to reduce the nutrient pollution from farms have largely been unsuccessful. In this episode, Dr. Donald Bosch, President Emeritus of the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, says it's time to change the approach and create a national strategy for regulating agriculture pollution. Don talks about approaches for reducing the use of fertilizers paying farmers for performance, improving water quality as part of fighting climate change, and involving science in solutions. You're in the Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. Here for this episode to talk about harmful algal blooms with Dr. Donald Bosch. He is Professor Emeritus at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science and has had an incredible career working on a lot of different issues around the Chesapeake Bay, the Gulf of Mexico, our coasts, the ocean, uh, a million different things we could go for with this conversation, but we'll talk about harmful algal blooms. Thank you, Don, for coming on the podcast. It's really good to be with you, uh, and nice to see you again. So let's start with just a kind of basic question for folks before we dive into the details and and propose solutions here. Harmful algal blooms, what are these things and what causes them? Well, harmful algal blooms, often called HABs, uh, occur when microscopic algae in the water, they could be in ocean waters or in fresh waters, Uh, or or cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria, which are sometimes called blue-green algae, proliferate to the level that it produces a harmful, one or more harmful effects on people, fish, shellfish, marine mammals, and birds. Some of these algae uh, also produce different kinds of toxins. Uh, They've evolved this over, you know, eons is a self-defense mechanism, essentially. (laughs) And And they can be cued to produce these toxins um, and as they grow uh, or degrade, uh, those toxins can be released, producing effects on marine animals and even humans, livestock and pets. Uh, they can even result in breathing problems to humans or memory loss or even death in extreme cir- circumstances. You know, there's a lot of uh, environmental issues capturing the headlines these days, right? You've got PFAS and you've got the impacts of sea level rise and climate change, and there's a lot with lead in drinking water. Um, but, you know, harmful algal blooms to me seem like one of like the most constant, widespread, difficult environmental challenges uh, that, that we have that don't quite kind of get the headlines maybe that they should. Um, and I, what's happening with the prevalence, the occurrence of these, and the intensity of them? Well, well, first of all, these algal blooms have multiple causes. They, they, they occur even naturally. So deep in the history, there are records of these occurring. Uh, however, al- uh, harmful algal blooms have tended to occur in particular where there's large concentrations of nutrients, not nitrogen and phosphorus, but also other uh, micronutrients are available. In general, the prevalence and intensity of uh, harmful algal blooms is thought to have increased in the latter part of the 20th century. You know, at the same time, all of those other things that you mentioned were happening. You know, climate change started to kick in, um, plastic production and so on. So at at their heart, and I think we can explore this later, they have similar root causes. Uh, However, uh, uh, recent careful analysis of records uh, from all over the world between 1985 and 2008 uh, by, by leading experts have shown that on a global scale, at least from 1985 to the present, there hasn't been sort of a general increase in these uh, harmful algal blooms. What we see as an increase is maybe more that we're looking more carefully, we're monitoring more carefully. However, uh, these authors also point out that uh, if you take a particular region or a particular species, there are these trends of increases uh, 
uh, that occur. And um, so uh, on the, the commentary that uh, you called me about uh, that Don Scavia uh, and I wrote uh, concerning harmful algal blooms also talked about hypoxia. This is um, where waters in the bottoms of lakes and coastal waters become depleted in oxygen. And that's because of excess uh, production of these microalgae as well. So those two things tend to be uh, also uh, related. And, and they're both driven by uh, high inputs of plant nutrients. And, um, and this is uh, an hypoxia. This also is uh, generally increased around the world, coastal waters and lakes uh, since the, in the light, late 19, uh, 20th century. And in some uh, well-studied areas, such as here in the Chesapeake Bay or in the Gulf of Mexico, um, hypoxia may, may not be increasing presently, but it's they're certainly not declining at all. Having worked uh, on the Chesapeake Bay stuff myself and being at EPA, I know those nutrients come from a variety of sources, but, you know, uh, stormwater, urban runoff, wastewater treatment facilities, uh, even air deposition, right? Um, that's me flexing my science muscle right there. And then uh, agriculture is, is a huge, huge contributor. Um, I think there's been some good progress in a number of those sectors at, at reducing the nutrient inputs, but ag remains the huge challenge. Uh, and the big reason why in places like the Chesapeake and the Gulf of Mexico that we still have these habs and dead zones. Why in your mind are approaches to reducing nutrient pollution from agriculture just not working? What's, what's the problem there? Well, let, let's take the bigger picture first, and then we'll focus on your question. First is that uh, the incidence and intensity of these harmful algal blooms, where they, where they worsen, is generally affected by human-caused over-enrichment uh, with nitrogen and phosphorus and the other nutrients. Call it nutrient pollution, if you like. Uh, and, and also, uh, now we've seen that the, these blooms are compounded and worsened and intensified by the fact that the waters are warming as a result of global climate change. So we're really facing twin challenges that are, are in many ways related to our profligate you know, reliance on petrochemicals uh, in the modern world. Uh, so you have to think about these root causes that we need to solve together. So let's talk about what's happened in places like Chesapeake Bay, uh, where we've been working on this and having difficulty. As you mentioned, um, we've had great success in, in, in implementing advanced uh, waste treatment to remove these nutrients from our industrial and, and municipal water, uh, wastewater supplies. Um, it's uh, not without cost, but it's been very effective and, and it's resulted in, in, some, uh, in some improvements. The other thing you mentioned also coming down, not really related to trying to manage water quality, but to save ourselves from air pollution, we have, we have uh, Clean Air Act, which has ratcheted down emissions from power plants, automobiles. And one of the emissions uh, uh, that, is, that has been reduced are oxides of nitrogen, which is produced by combusting fossil fuels. So as we've seen a reduction of that deposition from the atmosphere, we've also seen some improvements. Agriculture has been more uh, recalcitrant, basically. It's been hard to try to reduce those uh, nutrient sources, and for several reasons. First of all, the way we approach agriculture uh, is we want to maximize yield, right? We want to get the most production from a crop, you know, uh, that we can. Uh, it's it's natural human, you know, farmers obviously would be prone to try to do that. They, they'd make more money that way. Uh, and, 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 but these um, directions about how, what that maximum amount is, are basically assuming that we've got great growing conditions and everything works well. But in practice, this usually leaves a surplus of nutrients that aren't really taken up by the plants, aren't producing plant production in the farm field. So those nutrients go somewhere and they go running off into the, to the surface waters or going down to groundwaters. The second, uh, I think, reason uh, we have this uh, recalcitrant problem is that we have, we have uh, put, spent a lot of money trying to control this, literally billions of dollars uh, nationally, uh, even in the Chesapeake, well over a billion dollars who have improved agricultural practices to reduce pollution to the Bay. 
And the way we've done that is we've paid, uh, encouraged, voluntary, on a voluntary basis, paid or encouraged farmers to do certain practices that we assume are going to be uh, effective in the end of reducing those, those nutrient losses. And, um, but we've not really verified the outcome of that. Is it really working? Uh, did the farmers really implement the practices? Mm -hmm. Are they as effective as we thought they were? Is there something else going on that, that limits their effectiveness? Those kinds of things. So that's been a problem. Um, and, and, the, and the other issue is that in, not so much in the Chesapeake, but in the Midwest, where it's a huge issue, a water quality issue, not only in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, causing fueling its dead zone, but also all through the watershed, uh, we have had uh, policies, really government policies, that have promoted the expansion of corn-based ethanol production. This is growing corn, so not to eat, not to feed to animals, but to ferment and make ethanol from that we use in our as a supplement to our gasoline supplies those um initially it was intended that was going to be a short-term thing and we'd actually find some other way using you know grasses uh, so-called cellulosic uh, mm -hmm. ethanol that wouldn't require sort of heavy fertilization and the kinds of <laughs> intensive crop culture that we use for corn but that didn't pan out so we're now expanding and expanding just the other day epa announced it's rules to allow more, more use of ethanol, uh, corn-based ethanol and gasoline, our gasoline supplies. And in the long run, that's, we can talk about that later when we talk about climate and so on. It's really a loser because, we, as you know, one hand of the government is saying we need to move quickly to electric vehicles and get off of gasoline. And the other one say we need more gasoline supplements. So we need to kind of think that through in the long run. And then finally, and a very important one, is that most of the uh, grain that we produce, corn, for example, uh, goes not to feed humans, it goes to feed animals, and that uh, we have intensified animal production uh, because of our diets and wastes, and, and we are really producing a lot of, a lot of animals in a little space. So that means the, the waste products are concentrated in certain areas. So those are the kind of the key issues that we have to confront. We will return to the conversation in just one minute after a word about our sponsor, Varuna. This episode of Waterloop is sponsored by Varuna. Water systems are facing more requirements and challenges than ever before and have to stay aware and adapt in real time. Enter Varuna. The dynamic web-based tool helps water utilities to stay resilient by identifying more than two dozen risks that are both internal and external. These include all the typical risks that systems have to deal with, and also a variety of newer factors, such as climate change and environmental justice. Not only does Varuna track risks, but it makes recommendations on actions to take, and then changes status in response to measures the utility takes. And because public engagement is so important, Varuna provides information that can be shared with others, including customers. With Varuna, Better data means better decisions. Learn more at Varuna.city and let them know you heard about it on Waterloop. Waterloop. It's, a, it's complex. It's a very complex puzzle here when it comes to, to, to the nutrient pollution in these algal blooms. Um, on, on the ag front, you know, a, 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 little, a caveat or just a comment, you know, I think a lot of people involved in this space we obviously understand the critical importance of, of farms and food and the place of farmers in our communities and our economy and, and everything. So uh, sometimes, sometimes this pointing the finger at ag pollution when it comes to water quality problems comes off as not supporting farmers, and that's not that's not the case. I don't think. Um, so. If the voluntary approaches really aren't working, if the financial incentives piece isn't really working, um, what are some of the, the changes and solutions, Don, that you think could help tackle this problem of nutrient pollution from agriculture? And we looked at three big areas in the United States that were struggling to solve this problem. The Chesapeake, where we've made, as I said, headway with respect to wastewater, 
uh, atmospheric deposition. We were struggling with agriculture. Lake Erie, where we've cleaned it up, you know, saved it from almost miraculously, but now we're getting this problem of runoff of the nutrients that are built up in soils that I mentioned that are reversing the trends. In the Gulf of Mexico, where we really haven't made much progress. So we really have to figure out how to solve this agricultural problem. So one of the, of the ways that, in my mind, uh, and I'm not an agricultural expert, and frankly, as you said about farmers, I agree. The farmers I've talked to all trying to do the right thing, and, and uh, they're, being, they're doing what they're told is, gonna, is necessary. And they are uh, frustrated that it's not getting the results and that um, someone's not, not giving them the straight story about what, they need, what needs to hmm. be done. So, uh, so just in a top level uh, ways that we need to solve this problem. One, as I mentioned, we're putting on more nutrients than the, than the crops take up. So we've got to reduce that surplus that I talked about. One example where this has been done is, is in Denmark, which actually reduced its losses of nitrogen from, fertili- from, from agriculture, but fertilizing manure by, by over half. And they did it by saying, guess what, farmers? We understand you're struggling, but you're not going to be able to put 100% of what, sh- what you think the crops could uptake. We're going to have to, we're going to lower that to 90%. We're going to assist you, but it's, you, can't, you can't put the pedal to the metal, if you will. Uh, secondly, uh, and this is particularly the case in the Midwest, but it's in other areas. We we have many of these uh, agri- places where we're growing crops are wet, so we drain the drain the soils uh, through uh, drainage ditches and pipes, uh, you know, uh, under underground, and that just makes the system very leaky and it moves the water quickly out, polluted water quickly out into the streams. So we need to kind of manage that water um, balance better and, and we need to input in place within the landscape wetlands uh, that kind of help remove those excess nutrients. Third area that I would say is that we need to kind of change the way we approach this from a pay per practice, you know, we'll pay you to put in a screen buffer, we'll pay you to do this, that or the other, uh, and, and for a pay per performance. Let the farmers figure it out judge the performance on the basis of this nutrient balance question and let them be innovative about how to approach it. But, but only give them funds to do this if it's achieving real meaningful outcomes. Uh, phase out the production of corn to produce ethanol. We're, we're, we're going to electric uh, uh, transportation that's going to supplant, supplant gasoline, hopefully very soon. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to, uh, to kind of continue that practice, it actually produces more greenhouse gases, if you want to look at it from that perspective, than using the gasoline. So it's a loser in terms of climate. Um, uh, dietary changes in the long run. I mentioned all of this gra- all of this product we grow to feed animals, to feed us. Well, maybe we should be growing things, more things that we can directly consume from plants, including not only our greens, but our proteins and so on that... Uh, that allow us to shorten the food chain, if you will, and get efficiencies. And that's also a climate, a big climate issue too, because that's a, that's a cause of a lot of greenhouse gas production. And so while I'm talking about climate change, um, the, the infrastructure, uh, not the infrastructure, but the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that Congress recently passed has like $25 billion in that for help agriculture reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. And so there's a great opportunity to do that here, but there's also a great opportunity to, to improve water quality in the process. Why did I think that? Well, half of, half of the greenhouse gas emissions, in terms of their potency, from agriculture, from production of animals and plants on the ground, is actually not in the form of CO2. We usually think of climate change and CO2, carbon dioxide, but is actually in the form of nitrous oxide, N2O. And that it's because we have all this excess nitrogen <laughs> in our production systems, either in the fertilization or in the, the manure and the waste we have. And so some titles under this uh, new act provide funds specifically to reduce nitrogen, uh, nitrogen losses from agriculture. If we do that, we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, a very potent, short lived but very potent greenhouse gas, and we improve water quality. So I think we can 
see the climate crisis is actually providing us opportunities to deal with these problems rather than just compounding them. I always love talking about solutions on here. That's my focus. And I, I really love all those ones you just gave. Some very kind of on the ground, direct, tied to the farm actions, but then some bigger picture societal kind of changes that I think are happening, like you alluded to. Uh, being a scientist, uh, what are some of the, the additional ways that science can play a role in advancing this progress on, on ag pollution and harmful algal blooms? Well, I think you put your finger on it because science has contributed a lot, uh, but there's mm -hmm. still a lot, uh, still much to be learned. And there are many things that scientists would like to know. And some of those are things that would be very useful to know. That's what <laughs> we need to focus on. So uh, we need what I call solution-oriented science or actionable science. It means that you really need to do innovative, cutting-edge science, but also think about its use and application. I give you two recent examples on, on the topic we're talking about, one from the Great Lakes and one and de dealing with harmful algal blooms and another one from the Chesapeake. Um, it turns out that I mentioned this phosphorus um, uh, uh, you know, problem with, uh, with the cyanobacteria, and that's particularly a case in Lake Erie. So we've really been trying to ratchet down and control all of this phosphorus running off from the agricultural soils and so on. But what some of the res new research has shown us is that you got to be careful when you do that. You also have to, you can't ignore nitrogen because if the, the, the cyanobacteria have depleted and don't have enough phosphorus but have lots of nitrogen, they actually produce more toxins. So, so here's a case where, you know, now we've discovered with some really innovative basic research about toxin production and what governs it that's going to inform how we control both nutrients, both phosphorus and nitrogen together. Uh, here closer to home, one of our uh, graduate students, a PhD, got, did his PhD work on this issue I mentioned, managing the drainage from wet soils that we can, if we leave the, um, we don't drain them so aggressively and leave that water and keep the moisture in the soils, it, it provides, you know, it su supports plant growth but it also supports processes and the bacteria that actually can remove the nitrogen, put it, put it up into the atmosphere. So there's a lot of attention of how do we manage water levels and, and therefore reduce pollution of nitrogen coming from fields. One of the concerns is, uh, is that if we do that, we could also produce more of this nitrous oxide that I mentioned, N2O, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. So the problem is, well, if by treating water quality, will you make the greenhouse gas, pro gas uh, emission problem worse? As it turns out from this careful study and balancing exactly where the nitrogen goes, he found that it wasn't. And then if you manage it, you know, uh, under certain rules, you could actually do both. You could actually improve water quality and, and not, certainly not increase greenhouse gas emissions. Hmm. Again, I'll say complex and challenging, <laughs> but but some some good uh, some good solutions, some good science there. Um, one bonus question, I guess I have for you: just the Chesapeake Bay. You know, uh, I, I'm I'm a Maryland native. Worked on the Chesapeake Bay program there in Annapolis. Lived there, it's near and dear to my heart. Even though I live in North Carolina now, um, what's going on with the bay? How, how's its health? Uh, what's the latest? Well, we are uh, coming up, as you know, maybe the listeners don't know, into a big milestone. This is in 2025. We, all of the parties, the states and the federal government had agreed that we would take action to clean up the bay, to reduce pollution to an acceptable load where it wouldn't degrade water quality. This is called TMDL, Total Maximum Daily Yield. So we've been struggling to try to reach it. And it looks like Again, we're going to fall short. We're only three years or so away. We're going to fall short um, of that by not an inconsiderable amount, mainly due to the fact that we haven't made much progress in agriculture. And then within that realm, particularly in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. so we have big decisions ahead now. And it just so happens we have a new governor who came in into Virginia last year. We've got an election in Maryland right now, the new governor and an election in Pennsylvania, it's going to be a new governor. So these people <laughs> and these have to figure out, okay, what to do, because this isn't the first time we've missed the goal. We missed it in <laughs> 2000, we missed it in 2010, 
and we missed it and and um and, and we're, it looks like we're going to miss it in 2025. So how many do-overs can, <laughs> can you do? And then well, how, do you, if it, how do you close the gap in the, you know, the next few years, but also what do you do? What changes that would you make and how you approach this in the long mm. run? Now, having said that, the good news is with all of the things that we've done and effort that's been spent, mostly, mostly as I said, as a result of waste treatment, got lucky with respect to atmospheric deposition. The bay is healthier than it has been. The dead, dead zone is smaller than it was. Uh, uh, grasses are returning. It's still, you know, under under uh, care, but it's, uh, it's headed in the right direction. So it gives us encouragement that what we told you would happen is working. It's just not working. We haven't gone far enough. Yeah. So we need we need to finish the deal and, and meet that goal. And then we maintain it over the long run. And as again, going back to my, my, my theme about the, the joined at the hip nature of climate change and, and, and water quality issues and, and the excess not, and nutrient issue, I think, I think dealing with climate change gives us some opportunity to do this in different and, po and more powerful ways. Hmm. Think of no more fossil fuel power plants as we go to renewable energy, then the deposition that we have coming gets, gets to zero or close to zero. <laughs> sure. So we get that benefit. Uh, we, we, we have these investments that the Biden administration has made to reduce, to reduce emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. Well, can we gain something from water quality from that? So if we think creatively, I'm an optimist, and we put these together, I think we can find uh, solutions that, that help us on both fronts. Yeah, it's been uh, it has been inspiring and uplifting to see the bay starting to improve. Right after all these years of of trying things, people have put a lot of practices in place. Uh, nature takes time to heal to come back, but but it's doing it. Yes, further to go. Um, Don, thank you very much. A wealth of knowledge, as I expected. Uh, glad we connected in, in response to your piece uh, on, on this issue. I'll link to it in the description, the show notes for the podcast. But thank you very much. Good to be with you, Travis. Waterloo. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And thank you to this episode's sponsor, Varuna. To find all episodes, sign up for email updates, and connect on social media, visit waterloop.org. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop.